Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for attending our service for Lemmy. We are going to begin momentarily. Therefore, I ask that you please do return to your seats at this time. If you have yet to sign the guest book, you'll have an opportunity to do so following the service. Please do return to your seats. And I also ask that you silence your cell phones if you have not done so. Thank you. Can everybody be seated, please? Are you get out of here throw him out Nick Nick uh, where do we have well, squeeze in here up front throw Triple H out of here go on. good afternoon I'm Todd Singerman Motorhead's manager and on behalf of the Kilmister family and the Motorhead family I'd like to welcome you to the celebration of our dear friend Lemmy Kilmister it's really wonderful to see many friends and friendly faces ready to remember and celebrate Lemmy's life. We all know he wouldn't stand for anything formal or somber, and we all know we hope to be, or how he hoped to be remembered very warm. And Lem, believe me, it's warm. Since I first, pardon me? Since I first met Lem back in 1991, I can't begin to put into words what a great man and great human being he was. Damn, I hate using the word in the past tense. We have uh, many people, many thoughts and memories, and we will do our best to get everybody to express their sentiments and about Lemmy. Uh, so with that being said, why don't I call up Paul Lemmy's son, and we could start. Paul? There you are. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. I hope this isn't too long. There's 14 minutes. I timed it. <laughs> um, I had a feeling deep inside my father felt something was wrong back in August when I went to see him perform at the shrine in downtown Los Angeles. 
He looked more frail than he did the previous time I saw him, and his shaking hand was more pronounced. And when he spoke, his voice was softer, but the moment it came to showtime, his uncompromising grit and unyielding determination kept him performing at full beam. And I knew nothing was going to stop him, not even at this point, from getting up on stage and doing what he loved to do most of all. That's what kept him going. He wasn't about to go home and give in to any pain he was experiencing, no matter how serious. We'll probably never truly know how much pain he was in because he never complained. That wasn't his style. He was no cop-out and he wasn't about to become one. He chose to give his fans every last drop of himself those last few months instead. Even if I had known, even if he had known his grave diagnosis before the final tour, I know he would have done it regardless. That's who he was uh, and he wasn't going to give in as long as he could walk, stand, play his instrument and sing. All of his career he was a stage warrior, but he went, this went way beyond that. He took it far beyond his physical limits this time, still delivering his intense, brazen, high-octane rock and roll show after show, despite his body becoming weaker and increasingly frail, he simply got on with it, but this time against incredible odds. If the hill became steeper to climb, then he pushed harder to compensate until he achieved the required equilibrium to get to the summit. Towards the end of that final tour, I sensed he was walking an increasingly thin and narrowing line in order to keep on delivering, but he kept his balance and his poise perfectly, without falling once. And when I began to realize that was what he was truly up against, it blew my mind open and left me beyond speechless. He was now moving Mount Everest itself in order for the show to go on, even after receiving the shocking news of our close friend Phil Taylor's passing in November, which would have been a devastating blow to him, and it was. He still continued to deliver the goods, and the show went on regardless, telling the crowd, this next song was written before you were born. And he loved you all more than he loved himself. He loved his lady Cheryl, he loved Phil, Mickey, Todd, Cameron, Steve, Stefan, Tim, Laurie, Eddie, Arnie, Roger, Wendy, Shelley, Dixon, Emma, Mark, Dan, Adam, Francis, and everyone else that I've forgotten to mention now. He loved us all. We were all his extended family, and he was loyal, the most loyal man we ever knew and will ever know, and he gained our loyalty in return. He wasn't just a musician and a songwriter. He was a figurehead like no other. He showed us how to be true to ourselves by always sticking to his guns, and he never lost sight of that. Never for a single moment. He set the bar. There were no attempts to be commercial in order to cash in on a wider audience during a career slump. It wasn't about making more money for him. It was about keeping it real and authentic, regardless of any outcome. And there was no pause button or going on vacation after a grueling tour. He never liked swimming pools anyway, or golf courses, theaters, or di even discos, for that matter. You would be hard pressed to find a, Lem a photo of Lemmy standing around in a disco. <laughs> even despite his admiration for Abbott and the Bee Gees. P performing was everything to him. It gave him true purpose and meaning and kept his mind, body, and soul together especially in his final months. That was his idea of a yoga practice, his version of exercising or of working out. It helped any pain or discomfort he felt diminish, and the adrenaline rush of performing in front of the crowd is what charged his batteries back up and kept him on track. My father never had a stage persona. He didn't dress up for his shows, then change back into casual clothes when he came off stage. He was Lemmy all the time. He had style and charisma, but he definitely wasn't a poser. He, he just always looked that way naturally without trying. To him, it wasn't a business geared toward profit, and he wore no mask. He paid his dues for far too long to ever think or act like that. And I know that's one of the main reasons why we all loved him so much, as well as the music, of course. Motorhead's final album, Bad Magic, was not an easy record to get through for my dad. He struggled with it, but he got through it. And what's especially poignant is how much energy came from the band and especially from my father in those final studio performances. 
even at that fragile point in his life. I personally would like to thank Cameron Webb for having the facility to assist my father, Phil and Mickey, in creating a fantastic final Motorhead album in Bad Magic. When I listened to it, my dad, or Lem for you, revealed no trace of his frail health. And right after that, he went out on tour again, as he always did, once more putting his fans first. About a year or so ago, I intimated to him that the only artist who appeared to work and tour as hard as he continued to was James Brown. They both shared the same unshakable tenacity. That's what he represented from day one. Born to lose, lift to win. When someone has nothing to lose, their options are limited. His only option was to fight his way out of it, whatever it was, and the struggles were many. Some of them were lack of money, or back in his earlier days, waking up on someone else's mattress somewhere in the same clothes again. Living in squats in West London, his father's unwillingness to support or even approve of his decision to have a career in music, the unacceptable idea of being trapped in a dull, gray existence, the notion of failure or rejection as he had experienced on a few occasions. None of those things were going to get to him. And ultimately, increasingly severe illness, along with its sudden and unwelcome fragility, he consigned it squarely to within the final two weeks of his incredible life after fully completing his final European tour. He wasn't a religious man, and praying for a miracle was something that he would have viewed as a delusional act. But he was profoundly spiritual. Uh, that and a very strong sense of unique sarcasm and his own very special brand of ironic northern humor kept him laughing at it all. When I would drop by and visit him, and if there was a new Motorhead album in the works, he'd put it on and play it to me in its entirety, quietly singing along to it while sipping on a Jack and Coke. Hi, Paul, grab me some ice with you and get yourself a drink while you're at it. Then he would offer me a pair of headphones or put the album on through his TV speakers. I miss it so already. And when you put on some rough mixes of a new Motorhead album, you'd better keep quiet and listen. <laughs> he never tolerated anyone talking over music, <laughs> especially his. It really irked him. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but it annoys me too. Um, Dad and myself never understood those who might put on music in the background at a cocktail or a dinner party and then small talk all over it. He disliked formal events like that anyhow. You know, music isn't a background thing, he would say. You'd get a loud shh from him with an endearing yet stern frown. And if Cheryl's little Maltese dog Tutu started yapping over it, <laughs> he'd gruffly yell, shut up or I'll get that broom handle, shove it up your ass and use you as a mop. We'd sit on his sofa and watch Monty Python, listen to Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, Tommy Cooper, the Three Stooges. Maybe he'd read some Spike Milligan or show me his own hand-drawn cartoon strips and doodles, which were brilliant. He'd hand me books to read. One of my favorites was an incredible book on the Titanic. And earlier last year, he put on the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band album, Tadpoles, and sang along with every single word in the album's entirety to me. I laugh my ass off, and that's something I'll carry with me forever. So if you ever get the chance, put on the track Jollity Farm from that album and imagine him grinning at you while singing along to it. Sometimes I'd make him laugh too, and whenever I succeeded in doing so, it was like getting a gold star. We'd ridicule the ads when they came on TV. We joked about pharmaceutical infomercials, especially the bizarre part at the end where they list all the side effects such as dizziness, nausea, vomiting, strokes, heart failure, and death. We'd look at each other and he'd give me that face. He'd always brought me up when I was down. I'm going to miss that enormously. Nobody on this earth possessed his unique brand of humor, and it was a thing that came totally natural. He never faked it, just like he never faked anything else. He was 100% real, 100% of the time. I would go visit him, and he'd have on the History Channel, the Military Channel, Porn Stars, or Law and Order. He'd have a, open a book on guitars or a catalog on war memorabilia. He was an avid historian, 
and he knew the origin and background of every military piece he owned, or he might show me a recent acquisition in the form of a dagger, a medal, or a guitar, maybe, or his vast collection of military patches. He was unbelievably informed and very well read. He was a philosopher. He held the door open for you. He was chivalrous, a gentleman. One of his many great quotes were, manners are free. There was an incident that occurred around 1988 when, I was, when he was living in Fulham, southwest London. I was riding shotgun with a friend of mine on our way over to Dad's place. My friend's Rottweiler, Jacko, was in the back seat behind me. We were about five minutes from Dad's place when Jacko suddenly threw up all over my back and shoulder from the rear. <laughs> it was all down my left arm and in my, in my back and in my hair, just everywhere really. We arrived, got out the car and rang my dad's doorbell. He opened the door wearing nothing but a Japanese kimono looking <laughs> casually regal. <laughs> Saw the vomit all over me and slapped me on the back and heartily and said, a good night out then, son. <laughs> a huge shout out to my mum, Patricia. I apologize profusely in advance for this next anecdote, so please do forgive me, but I have to tell it. In an earlier incident, I'm in a cab with Dad going to a photo shoot in London when I was 17 years old. There was an awkward silence for the first part of the ride as we had never been in a car alone together before. Suddenly, he clears his throat and breaks the silence with, <clears throat> before you were born, your mum used to have the most fantastic pair of tits. I used to spend about half an hour on each one. <laughs> a quick comeback was in order, so I replied, well, and I thought I'd got him, you know. I said, I used to spend considerably longer on them. <laughs> Upon which he immediately came back with, yeah, but you were too young to enjoy it. <clears throat> and the time when my marriage broke down, devastated, I went down the rainbow instead of drowning myself in my sorrows at home and saw my dad for the first time since the marriage had collapsed. Sitting on his throne at the end of the bar, I told him, my marriage is over. She went away to India and got pregnant to a Norwegian guy over there, to which he immediately handed me a tall glass of Jack and Coke and grins. That was a close shave, son. <laughs> and upon visiting him at the hospital, I drew a blank asking the hospital staff where Ian Lemmy Kilmister's room was, because he'd actually checked himself under the name Just In Case. And more recently, or a year or so ago, the occasion he told me about how he imagined the pole bearers to be carrying his coffin. He joked to me about three six-foot guys on one side and three dwarves on the other, stumbling along to the theme tune of Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> he was not a conventional father. He wasn't around when I was growing up. But I never once felt betrayed by him over that. I never once harbored a shred of blame against him for it because he was truly a free spirit and I recognized that in him from the first time I met him when I was six years old on a cocaine deal. <laughs> I wasn't buying it. He had a definitive goal. He knew exactly where he was headed and in order to fulfill that goal meant that he had to keep his eye on the prize. He never compromised on that, not once. He removed every obstacle in his way through his sheer willpower and frenzied determination. He made huge personal sacrifices, and it did get to him. He may not have showed it, but you could occasionally sense it. But he just pushed on resolutely as he understood that it was necessary to do that in order to make it all happen. And it became my mission to reveal to him, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that I loved and admired him more than anything else in this world for being so true to himself. It didn't matter to me that we didn't get so much time together in my early years, because to me as a child, he was an enigma. 
I was fascinated by him, and I only ever felt love and admiration for this wild, long-haired man who was cooler than everyone else in the room at any time in any place. I, like us all, were drawn to his unassuming magnetism. They say you can't choose your parents. Well, I won the lottery when I got Lemmy. Because Lemmy Kilminster was my father. And he always will be. And nothing can ever change or alter that fact. And I would not have it any other way. You were perfect. My one and only ultimate rock and roll daddy. If I could only stand on your shoulders, what a view I would have. I love you more than life itself. Travel well, my dear father. You're back out on the road for the longest tour to the great gig in the sky. We will never, never forget you. I love you. We're going to call up uh, our next speaker, Mickey D. Ready? Yeah, well, well, here we are. Oh boy, Lem, I think uh, your son Paul basically said everything I wanted to say. Uh, I'm not going to share a bunch of stories with you here. I just wanted to say that my heart goes out really a little bit extra here to Paul and Cheryl. Uh, he was talking a lot about you all the time when we were touring, and uh, they were very special to him. As Phil Campbell and myself are, I guess we are the other family and that Lemmy had, and crew, of course. Uh, but let me, we were talking about the last couple of years, he, he struggled with his health. I, I remember it's, it's about three years now, I think, when he first had a problem. I mean, I, I had a pleasure and the privilege of playing and with, with Motorhead and with Lemmy now for 25 years. And uh, I never even see him break a cough or have a runny nose or anything. And, and then suddenly, three years ago, he ran into the wall. And uh, from that moment, we actually spoke about uh, normal stuff for the first time, I think, you know, uh, while touring. And uh, I remember Lemmy, he kept saying he didn't regret a single minute of his life. He enjoyed it absolutely at the fully, as Paul was just saying. Um, and he would, he told me all the time that he had the perfect life. I mean, to be touring and entertain people and see the smiles on people's faces and, uh, and do what we do, did. Uh, that was the perfect life for him. And uh, not to, the day he would go, he wanted us to, to cherish and, and honor his memory and, and party away big time. So I remember when Lemmy passed away that I wrote a little thing there, don't, don't cry in your drink, you know, sip it up and, and go and party for me instead, because that's the way he was. And I believe everybody in this room know that. But it was an honor, a privilege to, to have known and to play, and, and I learned so much from this great man. When I first joined Motorhead, I thought I knew quite a lot about rock and roll, and I had done some touring, but I was just a little pink baby, you know? It was basically nothing compared to what, what we've been going through, but we had some great times. I can tell you that, and uh, stories have to wait. I just wanted to say a few words. Uh, I miss you already, Lemmy. I miss our, our arguments and our hard work in the studio and on the road and the, so much fun that we have had. Uh, I will miss it forever, and I just want to say, rest in peace, my brother, my bandmate, my comrade, uh, my friend. Uh, and I wish 
the whole world actually could get a small piece of what I know about Lemmy that would actually help everybody to go through this hard time, I would say. If you just felt him a little bit, as we do, probably everyone here in the room, it, it helped me a lot, knowing that he was the man that he was. So thanks everyone for coming, and uh, yeah, uh, try to take it a little bit easier, Lem, on the other side. <laughs> Rest a bit. Uh, he does have a band there now. I mean, Taylor unfortunately left and Versal a, a while ago. So maybe they are writing some new tunes. I, I, I don't know. Hopefully he is. And uh, Phil Campbell couldn't be here, unfortunately. So I have to say hi from him as well. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, rest in peace, Lenny. <laughs> See you soon. Not too soon. Not too soon. By the way, this is from Phil Campbell. He made sure there's a line down there, and that's supposed to be speed for Lemmy, too. He made sure he had a mirror and the whole bit, so. Do it up, Lem. All right, Nina and Jim. These are very good friends of Lemmy's from Berlin. Well, these are some experiences we made when we were a young band, just existing a few years, not having done much. We received a phone call in the middle of the night from Todd asking us, can you be on this tour starting in four days because the regular support, and we are not sure, it's like metal techno, and I don't know if it's good for our audience in Germany and uh, it would be cool if we would come and play together with them as well. So we did and uh, packed our stuff, went to the first town, Stuttgart, did sound check and on the way back I passed by Lemmy and he said, oh, oh there's some, something going on. I said, yeah, uh, it was really quiet. I mean, our sound check had the same volume as my stereo in the living room. Uh, let's see what we can do about it, he said. So we did the show, everything was great, and Hobbs, the sound engineer, told us what happened. They placed from the motorhead crew two people left and right from the sound engineer who was supposed to do our sound, moved his hand away from the master fader, and put it on full volume and said, if you touch this, we're gonna put you away from the board. Put this into a perspective uh, that the band leader of the main act is doing this for the support act. And um, after the, when the tour was over, I asked Lemmy, <clears throat> look, next day we are starting our tour supporting Alice Cooper. And uh, in Germany, what we do, we don't know these people, can you write a recommendation letter? And he said, sure, give me a piece of paper. And he wrote down, Dear Alice, your usually good ta taste uh, let you choose my friends, this band. And um, the singer Nina, I hope you treat her well, otherwise she would bite your head off. <laughs> we showed it to Alice and he laughed and said, put this into the Lemmy case. Um, on the last gigs, I went to Lemmy and thanked him for letting us play on his tour. And he stopped playing the video game and turned to me and said fairly loud, fairly kind of angry, look, stop this, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you wouldn't be on my stage if you don't please my audience, but I saw you please my audience, so you are on my stage. We could be friends if you're not on my stage, but uh, you are only on my stage because it was all right what you do. And I was going, what am I going to answer to this? Uh, translate in my head, German, English, German, English. And all I could say is, thank you, man. <laughs> all right. 1992, Lemmy and I met the first time at the Concrete Foundation Music Fair here in Los Angeles. 
My band was just signed an American record contract and we had just relocated from Berlin to Los Angeles. It was in the backstage area when we've met the first time. I looked at Lemmy, bare chest, jeans jacket, ultra shirt, blue jeans shorts, shorts, a bullet belt, and flip flops. <laughs> I never seen any better combination in fashion. <laughs> Left and right from him, two very tall girls, blonde and beautiful. I've looked up to them. And Lemmy looked at me. I said, hello. And Lemmy said, hello. I tried to continue this conversation, which had started so well. But for some reason, I've had a blackout. So I've mumbled, I've got to go to have sound check. See you later. Almost a year later, I've received an official message from the Motorhead management that Lemmy would like to come to Berlin to visit us in our studio. When he saw the studio, he asked me, is this your studio? I said, yeah. And he answered, live here and die here. <laughs> Half hour later, I had to do an interview in a separate room. And without knocking, Lemmy walked in, made funny faces to me, and wrote in big letters on some blackboard, woofa, woofa, call the FBI and off he went. I had no idea how to handle this information, but it was an icebreaker. This was the beginning of a long time friendship, 23 years, and many happy days, and many, many fun moments. A lot of Jack Daniels and cigarettes, of course. Mountains of Kinderüberraschung acts and music and lyrics, of course. Thank you, Lemmy. I love you, Lemmy. That's Jim and Nina from Skew Siskin. Uh, I'm going to skip a little and move around a little if you guys don't mind. Uh, Bob Kulik. You hear Bob? I knew Lemmy for 32 years. He was my lucky charm. We won a Grammy together for our cover version of Metallica's Whiplash. And together, we did the theme of themes for superstar wrestler Triple H. We did many other fun and memorable recordings as well. But most of all, he was my friend. Lemmy Kilmister was a man who exemplified the qualities that we all most admire. Integrity, a man who lived the axiom, this above all, to thine own self be true, and as it must follow, as the night, the day, thou cannot then be false to any man. Passion, he was a musician's musician. He didn't care about the money, he only cared about the music. And a student of it, he gloried in it, he lived for it. He was as much a fan as he was an artist. Honesty. If you asked him what he thought of something, he'd tell you what he really thought. No political agenda, no patronizing, no bullshit. And as he would sometimes say to me when I'd ask him, what do you think of that? It's crap, rubbish. <laughs> and I would always laugh and say, which part? <laughs> Compassion. Despite his tough exterior, he was one of the kindest and gentlest people I had ever met. Modesty. He was a star in every way, yet he was humble and would take pictures with fans and engage in conversations with virtually anyone. He was never egotistical in any way. Sense of humor. He could laugh at himself and was fun to be around. And in a Monty Python kind of way, he would make fun of the world that surrounded him. The visionary, he had a vibe, 
a sound, a style uniquely his own, and to that extent, a leader, not a follower. He was a visionary. It was his way or the highway. Yet, he was not unreasonable, and if you could somehow convince him of something, he would go for it. I'm proud to say I knew a modern-day pirate, a genius, a legend, a man we all wished we could be. Rest in peace. The human race is a far worse place without you. I wanted to give a shout out, by the way, to Pete, who made Lemmy's urn over here, which is impressive. I mean, that's, I've never seen anything so beautiful. Pete, thank you very much, wherever you're at. Lemmy is in there right now, and Slim Jim, you there we go. This is a, as you know, Lemmy played with Slim Head Cat, and the smile on his face when you guys would play together was enormous and amazing. Hello. Did anybody else let Lemmy smoke in their car? Okay. But he always kind of asked first, which is uh, a, because he was a gentleman. That's the thing uh, that I want to really point out about the guy. Uh, he was a gentleman. I never saw him rude or inappropriate to anyone. In, uh, and we were in a lot of places where where that's the, the norm. Dressing rooms, airports, planes, vans, rest stops, everything. I never saw him rude to anyone, to a fan. I never saw him inappropriate with a woman. He was always very, very gentlemanly, very in his own way behaved. And I see him as an English gentleman as much as any, I, I see him in any other way. And I see him as a unifier because we look out and uh, there's heavy metal, there's hard rock, there's thrash, there's punk, there, and I like to represent the uh, rockabillies, and Lem straddled all those fences, and I never met a fan of music who didn't understand and get what, what he was all about, because he dug it all. One of the first nights I ever met him, we hung out and listened to Gene Vincent BBC recordings that he had recorded off his radio onto a cassette and was very happy that he met someone that could relate to it, and, that, uh, and we sat up all night playing chess and listening to Gene Vincent records that he had recorded himself. And uh, I just wanted to say that he was the last of a breed. I don't really know anyone quite like him, but he was the last of the Mohicans for sure. And I'm honored and also happy that I knew the guy in the way that I did. So let's enjoy his legacy. He was a very good guy at the end of it all. Thanks. We're running just a little behind, so I'm just going to call up some people, but let who, um, who's going to go up next with them. So Uta, who is Lemmy's dear friend and our publicist from Europe, has been with us forever and literally has nursed Lemmy to health for several years with his diabetes and <laughs> could tell you that she has been tremendous with us and family. I hope I can do it. Lemmy, the man who dared to live his life the way he wanted. Lemmy was a cosmopolitan, and his crew was international. So here I am standing to say farewell to Lemmy, a true gentleman I've worked for almost two decades. I've been with Lemmy through good times and bad times, and we had a lot of fun. He was an icon for thousands of people. His music was loved by millions. Lemmy was the last loyal, honest man standing in rock and roll, but for me, he was only my lamb. He always called me his German Shepherd because I would not only bark, but also bite if necessary to protect him from unwanted intruders and requests. He also called me his nurse on Prada because he had a view for what I would wear or like. One day in the hospital, I was pushing his bed through the corridors, and his German doctor Jens told, me, told him that I'm already the perfect nurse. Lem said, yes, she is, but she would never wear these hospital shoes. She would wear Prada. Since, ne since then, I was his nurse on Prada. Because of Lemmy and his bands Motorhead and Headcat, I was able to travel the world extensively. 
I've met so many people and made a lot of new friends. I was part of the Motorhead family, and I will be forever grateful for this. For me personally, an era is gone, and life is different since the 28th of December. I do hope his immediate family will cope with the loss in time and remember the great times we all had with him. Saying goodbye now was one of Lem's favorite series, Faulty Towers, we watched so many times on the bus, and he always liked to use the phrase, oh, you're German. I thought there was something wrong with you. <laughs> can, you can you do the funny walk for me? No funny walk for you, Lem, anymore. Auf Wiedersehen and tschüss, Lem. Okay, I'd like to call up Lemmy's assistants, uh, Ian and Dixon, if you both of them. Good, Ian, go first and then go first. Goodbye. Hey, everyone. Uh, I was Lemmy's personal assistant on the road for the last three years which were the hard ones, I think, maybe. And um, he was always extremely polite, as everyone's already said, and most of you know that anyway. And um, I thanked him one day uh, for never telling me what to do. He always asked. He always said please and thank you. And um, he said, well, we're supposed to be friends. And uh, we became friends pretty quickly. He was always able to deliver a joke uh, in a way that really reached its comedic potential, I guess. And you all heard his stories and his jokes a lot, and so did I. And uh, I want to tell one of the ones, I'll probably do a horrible job compared to him, but uh, one of his recent favorites uh, is about a horribly ugly guy who uh, asked God every day for uh, to be handsome. And uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, he said, uh, I, you know, uh, God came to him one night and he said, uh, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't. Get it. Okay. The, the rest of the joke goes, uh, <laughs> I'll just make this quick. Uh, there's a couple of things out on the internet that are great. From now on, and the Jack and Coke will now be called the Lemmy. That's a fact. They discovered a new element, a heavy metal element, is in petition to sign it. They're going to call it the Lemium. You know, you have to ask yourself, what is Lemmy? Who was he? He was just a friend. Yeah, he played bass. Yeah, he was a rock star, but he was a friend. He was literally the guy who would take his shirt off his back for you. He would take the last smoke and give it to the last guy. He would literally take $5 out of his pocket to give to the homeless to everybody. He was a father. He was a brother. He was just, he was a fucking good guy. And I'm going to miss him. He was really close to me. And on the day he passed, he was tapping his foot because he always wanted to be his last gig on stage. He never wanted to disappoint the fans, ever. And he was tapping his feet, and I swear that was his last gig. And to me, that was endearing. I love you, brother. I'm gonna finish. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. So God said, I want you to go uh, tomorrow uh, to the horse races and put all your money on pink eight and you'll have the money you need for your surgery. You can get plastic surgery and you'll be living out your rest of your life 
very handsome. So of course he does that, and going into surgery, he says, uh, I, uh, I want to look like Brad Pitt. Just make me look like Brad Pitt. Sure enough, three to four weeks later, he's taken off the bandages, and he looks exactly like Brad Pitt. And he's over the moon, and he's going to leave the hospital, and bam, he gets hit by a bus. <laughs> and he gets to God, and he says, I thought we had a deal. What happened? And God says, I'm sorry, I, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, wherever he is, he's fully recognized, and nobody doesn't know who Lemmy is, so Godspeed, man. And he would say, thank you very glad. Uh, Scotty this is one of Lemmy's best friends, and uh, when Lemmy would be off tour, him and uh, Scotty would hang out all the time here at the Rainbow. Well, shit, I guess I got to start at the beginning. I met Lemmy, I was the snake handler for Alice Cooper. And uh, 98 August, we were, Alice was playing the House of Blues on the Sunset Strip three, day, three nights in a row. And uh, on the first evening, it was just me and Lemmy standing at the bar. And I, I went up to him and said, hey, you're, you're Lemmy from Motorhead, aren't you? He's like, yeah. And I'm like, I just wanted to, you know, I didn't want to bug you. I just wanted to thank you for your music. You know, I ride a motorcycle for a living, and it's great driving music, you know, at 80 miles an hour down the freeways. He offered me a drink and offered me a cigarette, and it seemed like uh, for the next three nights, we, we were pounding around together. Well, on the second night, my snake, when she got on stage, she shit right on Alice Cooper. <laughs> so I go running past Lemmy, and I'm headed backstage, and I'm thinking, I'm fired. Yeah. And Lemmy's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, you didn't see my snake just shit on Alice Cooper. <laughs> and he just, he roared. He was laughed so hard. Oh, God, we always, uh, <laughs> we, to hear him tell the story of that night is, was pretty hilarious. I don't think I could tell the story any better than him, but, but from then on, it, I, I think I rode him to the rainbow after that gig on the back of my motorcycle. Here I had two snakes on the back and Lemmy. <laughs> wearing a police helmet. <laughs> so we arrived to the rainbow, and I have an eight-foot python in my jacket. And we walk in there, and right past the fireplace, my snake decides to come out three feet over my head. People are screaming to get security. Uh, and the security guard goes, I know you're Lemmy's friend, so just take the snake outside, and I'll, I'll let you right back in. You know, so that was my first experience meeting Lemmy, and uh, and when I saw got back to his place and saw his collection, I was like, I'm finally home. <laughs> you know, um, I've met so many awesome people. All his friends and fans became my friends. You know, uh, Doro Pesh. You know, I, 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 I got to meet Doro Pesh. For so long, I wanted to, to meet you, Doro. And, uh, you know, finally got, you know, let me, took me to Vacan 2014, and I was able to met, meet Doro. Met, he took me to concerts, you know, uh, took me to Metallica. I got to meet the guys from Metallica. And all, and all Lemmy could talk about when we were back there meeting him was, you should see this guy's helmet, you know? I, I made the, the dragon helmet in the movie, right? But uh, he would always, we would sit on the couch for hours, and I don't think I've had as 
many conversations about hours about the stretchiness of fabric. <laughs> he had to, it had to be the right stretch. Oh, that's not stretchy. This is stretchy, you know. Like, are you kidding me? That's stretchy. Well, I don't like it. Take it back. But never had an argument, never had one crossword. You know, we would leave, we would leave the, uh, the studio and he would be on the back of my motorcycle flying down Sunset on our way to Crazy Girls or Jumbos or, you know. And uh, we had a lot of good times in the studio and, the, and strip clubs. Uh, and it, we were always the last ones to leave. They'd be closed for hours and me and Lemmy would still be there shooting pool with the strippers. So, <laughs> and it was like that wherever we went. We were, you know, it was like he was treated like gold, you know? And he treated me like gold, you know? Uh, so many times we'd go to Vegas on his birthday and, you know, we believed, I know him and me believed the same thing, that if you die around your birthday, you know, it's just meant to be. You know, it's, it's the way it's supposed to be. It's checkout time. Check in on your birthday, check out on your birthday. So uh, when he passed away, I wasn't, I wasn't shocked. I was relieved knowing that he went when he was supposed to go. He was done touring and that was it. He was, when he's done touring, you're gonna have to bury him, you know? And so, Godspeed, speed, Lemmy, you know? Thanks for everything, all the, he gave me hats, he gave me daggers, you know? Gave me so many, so many funny, some funny instances. We would always laugh and joke about Scarface, you know, like, hello to you, mate. You got a bag for a belly. You're eating this fucking shit, looking like these mummies. He loved that shit, you know? And uh, Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein, you know? Frau Bluka, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he was just a joker, you know? So here's to you, Lem. I'm sure I'll see you in my dreams. And uh, have a good time up there. Take care. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to bring up Lemmy's girlfriend, Cheryl, and Michael Magnolari from The Rainbow. I'm not going to take long. Just don't do that one. Um, I just want to say to you one Lemmy loved me. But his greatest love was his fans and his music. And um, I remember saying, baby, don't go. Stay home. Skip this tour. And he said, baby, can't. I love my fans. He never raised his ticket prices because he always thought that everyone should always be able to afford to go to a motorhead show. It, didn't, it wasn't about the money. It was about his fans. And I think I made a quote on Facebook. I lost the love of my life, but the world, they lost them. So that's all I want to say. Just want to say rest in peace, my dear friend, to a wonderful historian, very intelligent. You all have heard this from his son, Paul. He's going to be truly missed, as you all know. God rest in peace. And for those of you that were at Lemmy's party, Michael's the one who jumped out of the cake for him. Uh, that was a, a nice, nice surprise. <laughs> there you go. Um, Joe Rambach, did you want to talk? Joe's uh, Lemmy's promoter from Germany from way back. 
and uh, one of his great friends. Thanks for coming out, Joe. Thank you, everybody. I had the great, great honor and pleasure of being Lemmy's and Motorhead's promoter for the last 20 years. And we had many, many legendary nights, parties, after show events, and most of them are true, all the rumors, you know, and one of the last ones I remember just a few weeks ago, it was he, he was in Berlin and he loved coming out to Berlin. It was like his second home in the world. And he loved coming out to the White Trash restaurant, hanging out with the band and the crew. And just a few weeks ago, he wanted to come over and he came and I thought, okay, maybe he's coming over for an hour or maybe half an hour, surely not much more. And then guess who left the building last man, two o'clock in the morning, it was Lemmy. The DJ went home, house lights went on, and he was still standing there on the pinball machine playing pinball, the Adams family. Lemmy, I love you. It was a great pleasure meeting you. And wherever you are, you never walk alone. Bye bye. Okay, Pascal, are you around? Where's Pascal? This is Lemmy's good friend, his boot maker. This is the man that, uh, the fashion. Good afternoon. Uh, I, was a, I was just a schoolboy in October 1983 when I went to see Motorhead for the first time in my hometown in uh, Clermont-Ferrand, France. And uh, I remember spending hours at the back door of the venue uh, hoping to meet the man. Eventually, a couple of goons came out and chased me. Um, uh, in 2000, when the wonderful Sharon Lee brought him over to, uh, to my place to get measured for a pair of boots, I told him that story. And only at that moment, it came to my mind that in 1983, I didn't speak a word of English. And uh, he gave me one of what I call lemisms. You know, he said, logic should not interfere with determination. And uh, I made a lot of boots for him over the years. And as, as a boy, I used to uh, read the name of all the people on the record sleeves that he would thank. And um, one day, I made the list. And uh, I was just so taken back that uh, I immediately called him and said, thank you for making a, a, my boyhood dream come true. And he just said, sorry. Had I known it, I would have done it sooner. Uh, he was that guy. He was one of the kindest person I have ever met. Um, it was a privilege to make his boots for 15 years, and it's an honor to see them go with him to his resting place. Um, thank you, and so long, Pat. I'd like to call up Stefan, Shirazi, and Morat. These are two very good friends of Lemmy. They respect it tremendously. And um, what are you up? Come on. Mo Rats over here. You're going to run away then, aren't you? Oh. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> After you. All right. Okay. Start now. This is not scary at all. Um, <laughs> remotely. Like everyone else here, I'm feeling completely overwhelmed because we're not just saying goodbye to a dear friend, we're saying goodbye to an icon. And I've spent pretty much the entire week wide awake thinking what I'm going to say about him, which is kind of ironic because if you hung out with Lemmy, you'd spend the entire week wide awake. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure you're all aware that he had a completely absurd sense of humour. So I did think of getting up here and just talking about the wrong person for a couple of minutes and <laughs> yeah. talking about someone called Arthur and his love of beekeeping, <laughs> just because Lemmy would think that was really funny. Um, and then I went through my phone because I thought, well, I'll tell them one of Lemmy's jokes, because I'm sure you all know if you had like, a cell phone, once he finally got one, he would text you all these ridiculous jokes at three o'clock in the morning because he forgot about the time difference. And I could find one that was suitable, all the rest were filthy. <laughs> and I apologize, because it's terrible. Two peanuts were walking along the road. 
and one was assaulted. <laughs> it's, it's not mine, it's his. <laughs> so, instead of making a further fool of myself, and I know there's people watching around the world who wish they could be here, I snuck this in, not knowing, of course, that Lemmy would, you know. Cheers, Lemmy, we love you. Uh, he was in 1982, and I formed a school magazine with uh, sheets of A4 paper, just four of them, so as I could possibly interview him. And he accepted the request and accommodated me for nearly three hours in the studio, um, you know, answering such devastating questions as, uh, when asked about Surbiton, Lemmy described it as, not exactly the hub of the universe. <laughs> I asked him what he thought of uh, being at uh, the top of the male sex object pole in 1982 in sounds uh, behind E.T. actually, he was behind E.T. The reply to my tentatively asked question of the matter was, I think I got the edge on E.T. I got longer legs than he has. But the thing, listen, everyone said this and it's so true. He, he was just, he was so kind and supportive and he gave me the belief that I could live a life that I wanted to live and that everyone was going to be like him. And he was always just, he was so consistent with that and he was so supportive. He was a very funny man, as you've heard. He loved humour, he loved Python, he loved the goons, Harry Seacom, he loved all those guys. And I've become aware that people don't really know who Spike Milligan is. So I'm going to read you a couple of Spike Milligan poems because he loved words. And as silly as these words might sound, they're quite brilliant. He was quite brilliant, and Lem was brilliant with words. So I'm going to read you Lobster. Libster, Lobster, Labster Lee, living in the deep blue sea. Libster, Lobster, where are you? Gone to lunch, back at two. <laughs> Which... I just think he's brilliant. And there is, there is another, there's another one here, if you're just sorry, I have to find this because it's just, it's not Judith Hart, it's not Malice you at Buckingham page, Palace. I lost my page. We could do the Ying Tong song. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, we could Ying Tong it Lai Po. He loved that song. It's a poem called Sophia Loren of Leeds. You'll notice a theme. Ingle jingle, jangle jom, tingle ingle, dangle dom, fringle frangle, bangle bomb, and there's more, my friend, where that came from. <laughs> and last but not least, I have to tell you, it was a really, I think for everyone, it's been a very hard, it's been a hard time. Uh, about 24 hours after we got the news, uh, the Swindon advertiser managed to make me laugh, and Lem, good God, he would have laughed at this so hard. Uh, the Swindon advertiser said that the gig in Swindon was in jeopardy due to the passing of the front man of Motorhead. <laughs> so I know Lem would have laughed and, you know, thank you so much, Lem. It hasn't sunk in, it won't, but thank you. Thanks very much. Johnny and Marie, you guys look like a good couple there. Um, Matt Sorum. I'm very honored to be asked to speak about Lemmy today. Um, I could know it since DePaul, Gilmister. It was so great that you were able to play for your dad not more than two weeks before his death. It was great, Paul. Uh, Phil and Mickey, of course, uh, Todd, the Motorhead management team, and the Motorhead crew, especially it kept the machine running all these years. And of course, Cheryl, my condolences. Oh, there you are, there you are, honey. Um, and to all the F Motorhead fans around the world. I met Lemmy in 1989 in London while playing for the Colt at a club called St. Moritz. I was with uh, the late, great Randy Castillo. He took me up to meet him. And the hello was, how you doing? Let's do a shot. And uh, our friendship had begun. And seeing him on the road or in the rainbow, he always made you feel special and welcome. 
but it wasn't until 2009, after break of my band, Velvet Revolver, I felt a bit down and didn't know what I was doing next. I got a text from Lemmy asking me to sit in for Mickey on the Motorhead tour. I replied, why me? <laughs> and he said, because Dave Grohl's not available. <laughs> Always honest, Lenny, straight to the point. I replied, when are we rehearsing? He replied, we're not. <laughs> Fear took my body over, but I took the challenge. And uh, I wasn't scared about the songs, I was more scared about the Motorhead fans killing me if I did not do the music justice. I woodshedded the stuff and headed to the 930 Club in DC. And when we launched into Iron Fist in front of diehard Motorhead fans, it was like being on Mr. Toad's wild ride. But the bus rides were the best, hearing the great stories from Lemmy and his knowledge of history and culture was fascinating. I did take the back lower bunk though and uh, basically was either awoken to the sounds of bombs exploding in epic war movies or ABBA blasting through his speakers. The sign of not going in the back lounge was when Lemmy put his boots in front of the door. <laughs> that meant some shenanigans was going on. Do not enter. I want to thank uh, Mickey for letting me sit in that drum stool because those memories will always be with me. It was an amazing time. Thank you, Mickey. And thank you, Phil. Uh, his hard exterior had a gentle side. He loved Eddie Cocker and Abba and the Beatles. And at the end of that short tour, I felt like shoeless Joe Jackson in Field of Dreams, and I could have just walked off into a cornfield. My life was complete. I played with Motorhead. I will always cherish those memories. Many people say Lemmy is God. I believe that. I do. I truly believe God uses people as vessels to share his message. When I got that text from Lemmy to play, it was a God shot. It said to me, everything is going to be all right. Forge ahead, take no prisoners. Lemmy's life was built on integrity, and Lemmy said, I quote, integrity is everything to me. I will not die ashamed. I will live on my own on my deathbed knowing that I gave it my best shot and everything else is meaningless to me. He taught me to never give up and never let anyone bring you down. And to all the naysayers, they can just fuck off. He gave us something to believe in, a place to call home. And once you entered your family, you were part of the Motorhead family. Lemmy wasn't afraid to die and he lived his life exactly how he wanted. Lemmy said, death is an inevitability, isn't it? You become more aware of that when you get to be my age. I don't worry about it, I'm ready for it. And when I go, I want to do what I do best. If I died tomorrow, I couldn't complain, because it's been good. I'm glad I knew you, Lemmy. Goodbye for now, my friend. Thank you. Uh, the next person I wanted to call up, I wanted to say a few things beforehand. Um, I want to be calling up Slash. And uh, if everyone recalls when Lemmy uh, had to end up getting the defibrillator put in, uh, Lemmy really had some hard times with that. And to be honest, I w he wasn't sure if he would be able to continue doing what he's done all his life and the way, you know, to be able to put it out at 110%. And Slash, I thank you profusely because truth is, without you being there and you literally were there every day with him. You held his hand through this thing and built his confidence. Played Coachella with him in the, the show we played at Nokia. And I don't think if it was for those shows that he would have carried on not knowing, you know, he didn't have the confidence knowing, can I pull this off? And he showed him that. And I really think, you know, thank you for those. I think it would have really stopped at that point had you not put in the effort and the love that you did. And I do think that uh, that's what got him to this point today. So thank you and you're up next.
Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm not real sure what to say here other than uh, Lemmy was somebody that I just feel so honored to have been friends with. And I, I met him at a, at a time when <clears throat> uh, Motorhead was one of my favorite bands and a couple of us from Guns N' Roses in uh, 87 in, in London for the first time and uh, got invited down to Motorhead studio to uh, meet the band. And I was, I was really fucking intimidated. I was like, you know, this guy who had this image of being, uh, you know, very hardcore and so on and so forth. And we, of course, had that sort of hardcore image. And I didn't know exactly what to expect. But I walked in and uh, was very graciously accepted by uh, Lemmy and company. And uh, we headed off after uh, the session to uh, St. Moritz, and we've been friends ever since. And he was just such a fucking great example of, uh, you know, what a lot of, I forget, most of my peers all want to be. Somebody who was like true to his school, uh, had more integrity in one finger than, you know, a room full of rock and rollers, you know. Uh, and, and straight up honest, 100% uh, loyal, and just all these really fine attributes. And a guy who uh, had this very sarcastic and very, as it was said earlier, you know, northern sense of humor. And I just love the guy a lot, and I'm gonna miss him a lot. But, uh, you know, all things considered, he did live the way, you know, his life the way that he wanted to. And I remember when I decided after years of struggling, that yeah, I was going to get, you know, I got sober. And the first time I, see, I saw him, and I didn't have a flask of Jack Daniels in my jacket, because that's how we used to always uh, greet each other. Um, he was actually very disappointed. It's the only thing I felt bad about getting sober. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, so let me just, you know, let me, I love you, we love you, and. Uh, what a fucking great example of, of rock and roll. And I'll always have that and, and his, his music and his personality and all that stuff will last forever. So God bless. I want to call up Roger. Uh, where's Roger at? Our stage manager. There you are. And I want to thank all the crew, by the way, that you know, isn't coming up to because obviously what made Lemmy really love touring was his family, his road family. That meant a lot to him, and being with his friends was everything. So Roger, come here. You can do it, do it. Do your best. All right. Just look at that face. That'll scare you off, this right there. God. Anybody else? Um, oh, first things first. Philip, if you're watching, You said you were going to bring a fart machine. We don't have one, so <laughs> sorry about that. Ah. Right. Lem, uh, first time I was ever in a room with you. I said something stupid, like really small talk. Like, Roger? Yeah. If you don't, say in if you don't have anything interesting to say, don't say anything. <laughs> Oh, okay. So then, months and months later, um, walking in a bar in Milan, and he's by the bar, huge grin. Like, hey, what's up, dude? I saw your skinny legs coming down, and I wanted to buy a drink for your smile, because I knew you were going to be smiling. And I just have to thank you for your unmiable self and taking care of our crew. And I was like, all right, that's tough. So I remember driving you, and you're listening to country music and singing out of tune. 
and complaining that no one can sing background music in Motorhead. I'm like, oh, I can drink. No, that's not going to be Motorhead, is it? And I'm like, all right, I'm not doing it. And it's just a pleasure having you in the car having a cigarette. Uh, I remember taking you to Marshall, and you asked for liver pate. <laughs> and we came up with your heads, and there wasn't a lawyer, not even Todd. Todd said, do what you want to do. So over a handshake between him and Jim, it's just how polite and gentle and old school these guys were. There wasn't anything to do with anybody. They're just like, yeah, let's do it. It's done. They're there. We're proud of that. We were proud of having the stage ready for you every day. It was a pleasure to have you on your stage every day. I remember you complaining that you never saw me drunk. I'm like, this is the only band that this is ever gonna happen. <laughs> like, I could, I was drunk before you, yeah, but I never had to hold your hair where you're puking. <laughs> like, All right. I remember our impromptu square dance in some stage somewhere, and I remember we were. We had this smoking hot all-female band opening up once, and I had a terrible gig. And the next day, we had this sound check, and it was perfect, too. You walked on stage, and then all the gear were like <laughs> And start walking towards me after the sound check. I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. Like, Raj, yeah. I heard you singing the guitar player. Yeah, yeah. I got the bass player. So I'll never forget how proud I was of wearing this the first time. And I'll never forget how proud I am of where the last time. <laughs> Thank you, Edu. Andreas from Sepultura. Thank you for Eddie and Roger here. All right, next. I want to bring up uh, Mike Inez and Whitfield Crane. You don't have to come the same time unless you want to, but. Come on up. Um, hi. So, you know, I love Motorhead. I've always loved Lemmy. Um, and I've always kind of wanted to be adopted by those guys. And in the last, let's say, three years, I'd find myself in Europe, post-tour or whatever, and I would hear that, um, you know, Motorhead was going on tour, so I'd devise a different ways to just kind of show up to Motorhead band practice and see, see if I could go on tour with them. Not with a band, just with myself, and uh, the resounding answer was always yes. So I'd go out on tour with Motorhead on a Van Hool tour bus, and the crew was awesome, and... The band was awesome, and every now and then I'd, I'd jam with them, but at night, after, um, after the, the show was done on the Van Hool bus, the, lo the lower part of the bus was absolutely 100% Lemmy's area, and then the upstairs bus was Phil Campbell, crew, including me and Mickey D up front. So I'd sneak down um, every night, pretty much, and sit with, for hours with Lemmy. I'd, I'd look at him and say, hey, is it cool if I sit here? And he'd, he'd, he'd nod me with his hat and his cigarette, and he'd sit there with an iPad. And he'd, he, would, he would quiz me, and he'd, put, he'd, like, he'd play a song on the iPad very passionately, every, every song very passionately, and he'd be able, do you know who this is? And I'd be able, no, who is that? And he'd be able, Dave Edmonds, right? Or, he, or he'd play me like some obscure Pink Floyd Sid Barrett song, and I wouldn't know what that was either. But he, and, the, and then he'd like play a song, and I'd be like, that's Carrie Underwood, right? And, uh, and I'd be like, Carrie Underwood, and he's all, Carrie's great. And um, 
the thing about it is each song he'd play, he'd like, you know, he'd like he'd make power chords with his body and he was so passionate about life and music. And so to sit there with him and um, see his passion in music that was so genuine. I mean, he just played a show each of these moments and he was so filled with, with music and love of other artists and all that. And, you know, I just am really grateful for that. Um, so I, I do, I do miss, miss Lemmy very much. And I also had some interaction with, um, with Phil Campbell. Um, and so I'm gonna read this from Phil. And uh, hopefully I can find it. Sorry, I'm creeping out. There we go. So uh, this is from Phil Campbell, with much respect. Um, he says, uh, it was an absolute honor playing, writing, and laughing with you. I will miss you so much. That's from Phil Campbell. Peace to Lemmy. Uh, thank you, Paul, and, and family, and Todd, for letting me speak to, to invite me to speak today. Uh, I just can't get over that. <laughs> that giant speed line made out of flowers is absolutely tremendous. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I am just pissed, and I'm sad, and I'm fucking gutted, and I'm fucking miserable, you know, just, just like the rest of you. It's, um, you know, I'm, all, I'm so grateful and I'm blessed for every road mile and moment I spent with this great man. I have like 26 years of stories uh, with Lemmy that, uh, like Mickey says, I, I don't think I'm ready to share yet. It's just, uh, it's, it's too soon and it's too personal. And um, so I guess I'm a little selfish too right now, you know, but uh, I can't speak to Lemmy being like, a, he, he was gravitational. Um, he just wanted to be in his proximity no matter what the scene was. He was always just the guy you wanted to uh, hang out with. He was such a gracious host and uh, just liked to make you laugh. He, he loved intelligent people. And um, I, for the most part, uh, I think he liked a lot of the fucking stupid ones too. I don't know. <laughs> it's just that, it was that kind of guy, you know? Um, he was just, just cool in every sense of the word. And I think secretly on some level, uh, all of us, every one of us, uh, hoped his coolness would rub off on us in some molecular quantum level. And, you know, let me be the one to tell you, it did not <laughs> at all. Um, Lemmy's brand of cool was like singular in nature. It was 100% non-transferable. There was only one Elvis Presley, uh, one little Richard, one Steve McQueen and, you know, one Lemmy. It's just, uh, you know, it, it, it's funny. A friend of mine yesterday, uh, when I was talking about coming and speaking here, um, said to me that uh, Lemmy was a man of few words, he says. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I just said, well, obviously you didn't fucking know Lemmy at all. <laughs> uh, God, I, I've been the sounding board um, to many of his like speed fuel diatribes and after hour lamentations, right? Uh, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. He, uh, he had many, many opinions on a thousand different subjects that uh, I could barely keep up with them. You know, I loved every single minute with him, you know. Mostly I just, I like to listen to him talk. Um, I'm just gonna miss that voice. You know, I just love hearing him talk, even on the few occasions when I, th I thought he was full of shit, I just would, didn't want to shut him up because uh, it's just fascinating to watch, you know what I mean, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so, you know, we're here today to celebrate the spectacular life of one man. We are also mourning not one, but two deaths, as, of course, Motorhead sadly, sadly is no longer. That's uh, one of the heaviest things to wrap my head around today, you know? Um, they, were, they were never the type of band to ride off gracefully uh, into the sunset. Um, that, of course, is not the Motorhead way. Motorhead eats fucking sunsets uh, for <laughs> breakfast. And, um, you know, Mickey, Lemmy and, and the bandmates, you know, just, uh, you stand as just a, a true, fine examples of what, uh, being a lifer in this business really is, you know. Um, 
completely all in, dedicated to a single cause. Uh, just a few short weeks ago, uh, it's, it's storybook end to the campaign. Uh, an Englishman, a Welshman, and a Swede roll into that dark, historic town of Berlin one last time and just plant that fucking motorhead flag, man. It was just beautiful. That is fucking poetry, Mickey, you know? So well played, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Michael didn't want to tell a story, but I'll tell a quick one. It was in 92 on the Aussie tour where uh, Randy Castillo and Mike wanted to come into the, our bus to go to the next show. And we stop off at a liquor store and basically have a full crane or a dolly full of Jack Daniels and beer. Wurzel, remember that one, Mickey? We had like about eight cases of beer and Lemmy had about two cases of Jack. And Michael and Randy show up with their six pack. Remember that? We just look at them like, okay. Then they look and they go, shit, what are we in for here? That was, that was a ride. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to be running out of time soon, but I've got a few more speakers. I just want to do a real quick shout out. This is dangerous to start getting into names, but wanted to thank Orika and Thomas. Orika's been Motorhead's label for, geez. 20 years now and want to thank you for sticking with us. Good and bad, you've, you've been there. Uh, Barry Drinkwater, our merchandise, global merchandise, thank you. Uh, Neil Warnock, Sam, United Talent, Andrew Goodfriend, Mike Monarulo, Steve Shank, and Rika from uh, TKO, and Wendy Dio, I don't know where Wendy at. Oh, yeah, that's it. All right, that's it. All right. And Shelly, who's been with us in management, geez, for 20, over 25 years here, so I want to thank you for everything. All right, um, next speaker will be Rob Halford. So much love. Love. Let me hello everyone on behalf of Judas Priest, Glenn, Ian, Scott, Richie, Jane and Bill from Trinifold, and Chip and Jen from Chipster PR. I'm here to include all of our love for Lemmy and Lemmy's family. Over the years, We've had so many amazing times with Lemmy and Motorhead, on and off the road. Most recently in Europe and South America. We always look forward to seeing the lads when we kicked off working together, as we knew well in advance there would be more than one Lemmy moment or a Phil King of Comedy Campbell <laughs> event. Yes, laughter was the overriding emotion with the guys. And as, as we know, if you can't have a good laugh on the road, you might as well pack it in. On a personal note, when I was in the presence of Lord Lemmy, I always felt a bit overwhelmed. Admiration mainly. Here is a man that lived rock and roll life on his own terms a true rock and roll maverick. His music speaks for itself, of course, and as we know, the music lives forever. Here's something I would like to share that took place between me and him in South America. We just completed the tour down there with Ozzy, and we were all heading back up here. I was wandering around the airport lounge very late at night. It might have been early in the morning and I saw him sitting by himself in a corner. So I wandered over and said, all right, Lem, yeah, I'm all right. We've had some good fun on this one. And then for some reason, I took his hand and we sat there in silence for a few minutes. Can I do a selfie? He gave me the Lemmy look <laughs> and I have expected, no, bugger off. 
at that tired and godly hour of the morning, but he said, no, no, go on then. So I did, and then I kissed him, and then I told him that I loved him. When, I, when the news hit, the first thing I did was put that on my Instagram. It's a moment to share, a moment to cherish, a moment of unconditional love. Faith, family, friends, fans, God bless you, Lemmy. Scott Ian. In uh, 1999, I got a phone call asking for a quote. Motorhead was putting together a live record, the Everything Louder Than Everything Else record, and uh, I guess they were looking for quotes from guys and bands that were influenced by Motorhead, and of course I was honored to, you know, to be asked to do that. And so of course I get off the phone and then I'm in like complete panic because what do you say? Uh, you know, what are you just gonna say? Motorhead rules. Uh, you know, what, what do you say about, about Motorhead that hadn't been said? And uh, so uh, I just kind of sat around all day thinking about it and thought back to 1980 when I, I bought my first Motorhead record. I bought Ace of Spades, knew nothing about the band because I used to buy albums based on album covers. And, and uh, I was just looking at this album cover thinking, God, this has got to be good. These guys look like some tough motherfuckers. So take the record home and put it on headphones in my little tiny room in my mom's apartment. And uh, Ace of Spades opens the record. And when you're 15 years old hearing that for the first time, it fucking blows your brains out. And I, I listened to the record probably three times, you know, front to back, just staring at that album cover, staring at it the whole time, thinking, who the hell are these three Mexicans and how do they play so fast? <laughs> They looked like banditos. They certainly didn't look English. It's pre-internet. So I jokingly, <laughs> I jokingly email that quote. Well, that ends up being the quote on the record. <laughs> Turns out Lem loved it. <laughs> and of course he would with his sardonic sense of humor and um, yeah he loved it so now you know like a hundred years from now and some kid is looking at well whatever format it's in but looking at the album cover and and uh, decides I'm gonna pick up this record because it's cool and it reads my quote and Mexicans the guy I knew that guy from Anthrax was an asshole <laughs> You know, the St. Moritz has been brought up a couple of times tonight. I thought I was the only one who met Lemmy for the first time at the St. Moritz. And <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I saw an interview with Lemmy just from a few weeks ago. It was just online. It was on German television. And uh, to quote him, he said, uh, it was Elvis who taught us how to dress or how to look. It was Carl Perkins and Little Richard who taught us how to sound. And it was the Beatles that taught us we could write our own songs. Um, and Lemmy, it was you who taught us that we could be fucking real. Thank you. You got to get Scott's book and hear that story of Lemmy when you had your first drink with Lemmy at the San Maritz. That's. I should repeat it to embarrass you, but I won't. Um, Triple H. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm honored to be here in any way for Lem. Um, one thing I do know about him is when you listen to this room and you see all of this and you see all of you and the love that you're pouring out and the laughter, that's what he would want. 
He wouldn't want people crying. He wouldn't want people mourning. He would want people happy celebrating his life. And thank you for that. Um, you know, I grew up a kid, just probably like a lot of people in this room, fan of his music, got in the wrestling business, became successful enough to where I finally reached a point where I could have some input into what my entrance music was. And entrance music for what we do, as all of you would know, you know, it's music creates the image. Music creates the emotion and the feel for what you do. It can create a character and it can mean success. And when I had the opportunity to, to participate in, in creating my music, I wanted it to sound like Motorhead. I wanted that raw, guttural feeling. I wanted Lamb. I wanted all that passion and that power um, to create the ultimate badass in what I did. And at a certain point in time, they just couldn't get the sound right trying to make it otherwise. And, and our people came to me and they said, what do you want? I said, I want Motorhead. And they said, well, why don't we just ask Motorhead? And I said, because I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> and, I, and we made the call. And Lem and Mickey and Phil gave me, the greatest, gave me the greatest gift of all time, which was their sound. They gave me the sound of Motorhead to create one of the bad, most badass themes in the history of the WWE. They created the game. They then went on to create King of Kings. They went on to create Evolution for me. Um, and it was this amazing partnership. And, and trust me, if you're not a fan of what we do, if you're in a stadium with about 80,000 people in it and you're coming up on a riser onto a stage with smoke all around you with the world title around your waist and you look to your side as you come up with lasers and pyro and motorhead playing and fucking Lemmy is standing next to you singing about you, it is the most kick-ass thing of all time. <laughs> More importantly than that, though, over the years, Lemmy gave me the gift of his friendship. Um, you know, we connected. In, in some way, we connected. He would always come uh, whenever he was in town and we were in town. Most often, it would be Staples Center, but London, wherever we were. Um, he'd come to the Staples Center, and, and uh, they'd tell me Lem would arrive, and, and his white limo would pull in downstairs, and he'd wait. And before my match, they'd go get him, and he'd come out, and he'd sit in the arena in the front row, and I'd say hi to him on my way into the ring and I'd wrestle and then I'd come out and I'd talk to him again and then he'd say, I'll see you in the car. And he'd wait outside until the show was over and I'd showered and I'd come back and I'd sit in the car with him for hours and we'd just talk. And sometimes he'd play me the new Motorhead, sometimes he'd play me something else he wanted me to hear or a track that he was working on for us or um, a lot of times we just talked about life. And after that had happened four or five times, I, I was the bad guy in wrestling. And uh, after four or five times at the Staples Center, I remember going to him one time after getting beaten again and uh, walking up to him. And Lem, I went over to him to shake his hand and I gave him a hug and he looked right at me and he goes, man, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you can't win a match to save your life. I don't know why I come and see you. And I, I guess I probably looked at him stunned and he grabbed me by the back of my neck and he said, that's why you're perfect for Motorhead. <laughs> um, he, uh, you know, a lot of, you hear a lot of people talk about the, the differences in who he was, you know, on an image and in front, the ultimate rock and roll icon. But then the, the guy behind that was totally different, polite and, and, and all the things that you've heard said. And, it's one quick story for me that encapsulates a lot of that. I, I went to a show. We were in Phoenix. There was a stadium show that was going to be playing the next day, so I stayed over with my wife, and uh, Motorhead was playing, and there was a bunch of other iconic rock bands, heavy metal bands, that I won't say the name of, just in case you're embarrassed by the story. But they were all there, and um, we walked in backstage, and uh, Todd was with us, and as we're walking down the hallway, I'm passing by all these iconic heavy metal stars that I am in awe of, and I'm looking at all of them, and they're wearing Bermuda shorts and Hawaiian shirts, and they've got glasses of wine, and there's incense, and there's, like, it's not at all what you would expect growing up as a kid, you know what I mean? Uh, seeing all this, and this is what, as I'm going down the hallway, and I'm seeing all that, and I'm thinking, wow, this is just so different, because a lot of these bands I'd never met before, and then I get to Lem's dressing room. And Todd opens the door and I go to step in with Todd. And he goes, Lem, H is here. 
and there are two topless girls. There's a pile of blow, a bunch of pills. Lem has a towel on and another towel on his head, like a big giant turban. And he's like, come, tell him to come in. And as I go to step through, he says, with Steph, my wife, and Lem goes, shit, close the door. And they close the door. We stepped out, close the door. A couple minutes go by, we open the door back up to step in. Now with my wife, everybody has clothes on. Lem's got pants on. <laughs> The drugs are miraculously gone off the table, which I'm only assuming he did all of. Um, and uh, he still did have the turban on, though, like a three-foot turban. But it just, he would not be seen in that light. You know, in some way, the ultimate gentleman. And, and that was always the coolest thing about Lem. We had this friendship. We wouldn't see each other for years. And then uh, we'd, we'd see each other, and it was like no time passed. And we'd just catch up uh, about a... Maybe two months ago, uh, for WWE, sensing everything that was going on, <clears throat> we connected with Todd and asked if it would be possible to sit and interview Lem, because I thought it would be important, and I don't know if anybody else was going to do it. And um, we met at the Rainbow, and I had seen Lem six months earlier, and he didn't look good. Maybe a year earlier, he didn't look good. And uh, when he showed up that day, man, it was like the clock had rewound 10 years, right, Lem, Todd? I mean... He was, we spent two hours doing an interview. He laughed the whole time. He told jokes. He was as upbeat as could be. I mean, when it was over, he was like, that's it? You want to do more? Um, it was just the coolest thing, and that is how I will remember him, as just that, that beacon of strength and laughter and uh, just all of it. The thing I will say about Lem, whether he meant to do it or not, is he was an inspiration of how do you live your life. Live your life for you. Do what you want to do. He did it his way. He did it his way right until the last day. And, and if, if there is a better way to go out, I don't know what it is. That is what it is about in life. And he was an inspiration, probably an inspiration, as you heard today, to a lot of people in this room. He was the inspiration for you to go out and be an inspiration to millions of kids who will go on to be that inspiration. That is his gift to the world. And I can't think of a better gift. I can't think of a better man. And uh, I'm just, I'm honored to be up here. And Lem, I'll see you down the road, my friend. All right, we have 12 minutes left of going over a half hour already. So. I want to call up Lars and Robert, but before I, as you're coming up, let me just say that one of the biggest highlights in my 25 years with Lemmy that he had always spoke about was the, his 50th birthday party we held at the Whiskey A Go-Go, where Metallica came out dressed as the Lemmys and played for him. And I have to tell you, you know, there's not a lot in life that, uh, you know, could match something like that. So we want to thank you guys for being there. and. The Thank love you. you have shown him. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. 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 I don't want to take too much time here. Um, Lars has some amazing words to share with you. Um, anyway, oh, I tell you, for the last two years, for some reason, I feel like I've really connected with Lemmy. I've known him obviously a lot longer than that, but for some reason. These last couple years, um, I've had what I call quality time with this amazing person. Um, there was a moment a couple years ago, um, I needed Lemmy to do his voiceover for an animated short I, I uh, put together called Talica Parking Lot. And um, he, I call him up, I said, Lemmy, you know, can you do this? And we only had one day to do it, and he was like, yeah, yeah, but I need a ride, come pick me up. I said, he's like, be there at three o'clock. I said, okay, Lemmy, I got a surprise for you. So I uh, have this Buick 64 Lowrider Riviera, and it's cobalt blue, beautiful, beautiful car, but it, it wasn't running right, right? The starter's not working, needed a tune-up, the whole deal. So I had a mechanic show up earlier that morning, 9 a.m. He gets my start, puts a new starter in, changes the oil, tunes the car up, and I'm proud. I show up at Lemmy's apartment about 20 minutes before I'm supposed to be there, and Lemmy comes out, 
we're looking at the car, he's complimenting and he loves it. We get in the car and I'm sitting there, yeah, I got this. I, I, I put the keys in, car doesn't start. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And let me sit in there with a cigarette, he's not saying anything. <laughs> and I'm, now the beads of sweat are rolling down my face. And he's saying something, all this, and I'm just like, and I'm determined. And then finally, he gets his word and he says, um, he, he said, let it sit for a while. And I said, excuse me, let it sit for a while. And so we get out of the car and he's like standing outside, he's smoking his cigarette, he's looking around the neighborhood and he's giving me sort of a history lesson on his street. You know, Charlie Chaplin used to hang out there, Mary Pickford there, and, and you know, and it was really great, it was beautiful and interesting. And then right in the middle of his story, he says, now try it. So we get in the car, and sure enough, that puppy started right up. And then he said, see, I told you it was flooded. He's like, <laughs> he's like you, gotta res you gotta respect you know, these older cars. So Lamy and I proceeded to go to the, um, to the uh, voiceover studio in Hollywood traffic, and I'm in my lowrider, and we're bouncing in the car, the Mexican and the rock legend, and uh, we're listening to all different styles of music, and it was just really an incredible moment for me. To, I mean, I, we left the, the, the studio, he gave us two hours of voiceover, we drank Jack and Cokes together, which I never drink. I hadn't drank that in about 15 years. I drop him off at his house. I actually lost my way home. I'm trying to get from Hollywood to Venice Beach, and I actually ended up somewhere in like Westwood or something, completely lost. Um, and the last thing I got to say is about a year, a year ago, I got to hang out with Lemmy at the House of Blues, Cheryl Lazare, and my other good buddy, Joni Mitchell, walks in, who I had invited to see me play at this particular gig. She, I got Lemmy to the left of me, I got Joni Mitchell to the right of me, and they're both chain smoking and I'm inhaling this <laughs> massive amounts of rock and roll legend smoke and I was loving every minute of it. And, he, and I introduced him, I said, Joni, I want, want to introduce you to my friend, Lemmy. And she goes, hi, Lenny, it's a pleasure to meet you, like that. And he takes a big drag of the cigarette and he looks over and he goes, Joni, what fucking chords were you playing on court and spark? I could never figure them out. <laughs> and so they have this beautifully incredible um, conversation together and I'm just sandwiched between them and I'm loving every minute of it. I've got these two rock and roll pirates, legends, icons, and I'm engulfing their, their magic smoke. And I just want to say, Lemmy, I love you, we love you. When I saw him at his birthday party, I, um, you know, I sat with him. He embraced me, and, and it was very sad, because I knew that would be the last time I was gonna see him, and uh, we both knew. But at the same time, I know he appreciated, you know, our presence in, in love, and we must always respect and love and remember and celebrate our elders, because we have them here, and we have to enjoy that time, and, um, and I know he'd be so happy to see us all here. Right? I mean, yeah. I, we love you, Lemmy. Thank you. And uh, here he is, the one and only. <laughs> I saw the picture of him sandwiched between the two legends. It's pretty cool. Um, I just had to check a few seconds ago whether we ever played with Motorhead in Phoenix. And, um, Thankfully we, th thankfully, we didn't, but I just had to spin that one in my head for a second. Um, so I think like uh, Mickey and Mike and a few others, um, maybe I'll keep the, uh, the personal stories and the shenanigans, save those for another day. So instead, uh, I'll share this with you. Uh, uh, self, uh, quite often. But it is significant because of where I threw up. I was in Lemmy's hotel room at the Sunset Marquee at about four o'clock in the afternoon on the day they were playing the biggest show on their Iron Fist headline tour of the US. I was there drinking and socializing with Lemmy five hours before they were going on stage. I was an awkward 18-year-old snot-nosed kid hanging out in Lemmy's hotel room that's very significant. In the late 1970s, when I was growing up, uh, I spent a good deal of time outside the Plaza Hotel 
in Copenhagen. Some of you guys down here may have been there. Uh, and over the course of those years, I met many uh, great people, Richie Black, Mulroney Deal, Phil Linden, Robin Trower, and they were all kind enough to sign autographs, take a picture, exchange a few seconds of pleasantries, but that was kind of that. Subsequently, after moving to America, I was now in Southern California, and Motor had become the primary musical force in my life. I lived and breathed every note they played, every word Lemmy sang, and every tall tale that I read in, in interviews. When they came to the U.S. for the first time in 81, supporting you, Ozzy, I was obviously more than thrilled and was going to follow them all over California for the whole week. There I was literally following Motorhead around, I mean, driving behind their tour bus, up and down Interstate 5, the biggest fanboy on the planet. But this was different. Unlike some of the rock stars I'd met in Copenhagen years earlier, Motorhead, and particularly Lemmy, embraced me with open arms. There was no preciousness, no mindless banter, no quick picture, and off you'd go. It was a completely different attitude and a completely different set of rules. At the first show, I was immediately invited into their inner sanctum, the dressing room, the back lounge of the tour bus, and over the course of the following week, I was in the hotels, the bars, the truck stops. There were no limits whatsoever. I was always welcome in and felt like these guys actually cared about me. Lemmy was so fucking hospitable, like the ultimate party host and caregiver who took me under his wing and made me feel like I belonged to something that was much greater than myself. A month later, I was roughing it through England towards my destination of the heavy metal holocaust in Port Vale, a stadium gig that Motorhead were headlining. Now that summer in 1981, No Sleep Till Hammersmith had come out and ended the chart straight at number one, and they were the biggest band in Europe. I showed up at the sold out gig with no ticket, not a pot to piss in, but within 15 minutes, I was backstage in the Motorhead compound where Lemmy once again had invited me in and welcomed me with open arms and remembered me from California a month earlier. The biggest gig of the summer in England and Lemmy still had time for little old me. Now fast forward another month uh, to the Nomus rehearsal studios in London where I'd gotten wind of the fact that the uh, boys were working there. So I headed straight down there and once again, much to my disbelief within a few minutes, I was sitting in a small rehearsal room with Lemmy, Fast Eddie, and Filthy Animal and listening to them write songs for their Iron Fist album. Right in front of me, there were four people in that room, and I was one of them. It was a total mind fuck. I was 18 years old, and these events made a huge indescribable difference in my life over the course of that summer. It made me want to be in a band. It made me want to form a band. It made me want to be a musician, be part of a group, be part of a collective, be part of the craziness of the traveling rock and roll circus. And one day, maybe we could extend that same open door, that same open embrace to other awkward and disenfranchised kids that hopefully one day would come our way. So in the thousands of interviews uh, I've done since then, I've always cited Motorhead and Lemmy as the main inspiration and the primary reason that Metallica exists both musically and attitude-wise. So thank you, Lemmy, for helping shape who I am today. Thank you, Lemmy, for the open door, for the music, for the drinks, for the laughter, for the stories, for never judging us, for always making me feel part of something that was so much bigger than myself. And thank you for always mastering the fine balancing act of being just enough of a rock star to be cool, but not too much of one to be uncool. So finally, I just want to say thank you for also taking a picture of me while I was sitting in your hotel room at the Sunset Marquee with barf all over myself and putting it on the inner sleeve of your next album, or Gasmatron. That was the ultimate seal of approval, the ultimate compliment. I will forever be appreciative and grateful to have known you and beyond proud to shout from every fucking rooftop how much you have meant to me and how your attitude and all-around coolness has inspired me over the last 37 years. Rest in peace, big man. All right, Dave Grohl, we've got four minutes till they cut us off. And immediately after this, everybody's going to the rainbow and let's celebrate. Hi guys.
there's not enough time for me to tell you how much Lemmy meant to me and all of the amazing experiences that I had with him. The first time I met Lemmy, I was at fucking Crazy Girls <laughs> about 20 years ago. And I was walking back to the men's room. On the way back, I looked to my left and I saw Lemmy by himself in the corner on a video game. <laughs> and I, it blew my mind. I knew that I couldn't just go say something because he was on his own in the corner. On the way out, I thought, I have to say something. He's my hero. He's the one true rock and roller that bridged my love of ACDC and Sabbath and Zeppelin with my love of GBH and the Ramones and Black Flag. So I walked up and I said, excuse me, Lemmy, I don't want to bother you, but you've influenced me so much. You're my musical hero. I'm a musician. I play in the Foo Fighters and, and I was in Nirvana. And he looked up from the video game and the first thing he ever said to me, he said,
people he didn't know, people he loved for years. He was so kind. He and I shared a love of Will Richards. I always said if there was one person I could meet, it would be Will Richards. Because he's more badass than Will Richards. One day I was at the airport at LAX and I was standing out on the curb and this guy comes up to me and says, Hey, I heard you're the only person I want to meet Will Richards. I said, Yeah. He said, Well, that's my dad. He goes, Why? He goes, Come here. We walk over this limo. Let me hand. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, help me stand. Lord, I'm tired, I'm so weak. Lord, you know I'm worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. When my way, it gets kind of dreary, precious Lord, somewhere near. When my light is almost gone, Hear my cry, Lord, hear my call. Hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. Cheers, Lammy. I miss you.